Florence Rousseau. I'm the Acting Director of Marketing and Communications and Business Development for Magnet. Uh, I'm extremely happy to be here for this roundtable discussion. Uh, but be first, before we start, I would like to begin acknowledging the Indigenous peoples of the lands that we are on today. While we meet today on a virtual platform, I would like to take a moment to acknowledge the importance of the lands which we each call home. We do this to reaffirm our commitment and responsibility in improving relationships between nations and, improve, and to improving our own understanding of local Indigenous peoples and their cultures. From coast to coast to coast, we acknowledge the ancestral and unceded territory of all the Inuit, Métis, and First Nations people that call this land home. Please join me in a moment of reflection to acknowledge the harms and mistakes of the past and to consider how we are and can each in our own way try to move forward in a spirit of reconciliation and collaboration. So welcome again uh, to our roundtable discussion, exploring opportunities in rural communities. The purpose of the series was really to created with the intention of breaking down silos across different sectors and meant to create opportunities for cross-sectoral dialogue between community-based employment agencies, post-secondary institutions, and employers across Canada on issues related to the future of work. This roundtable discussion consists of bringing together subject matter experts like the, those we have here today and leaders in the industry and in chambers of commerce with re from regions across Canada. Through an open conversation, these panelists can really share their knowledge, experiences, and lessons learned. In today's discussion, exploring opportunities in rural communities, the goal for the session is really to try, identify, and explore and build meaningful opportunities in rural communities, especially as we move past this pandemic. I would now like to introduce our wonderful moderator for the session, Shelta Bryan, CEO of OnPoint, who will introduce the panelists and get the discussion going. But before I do, I'd really like to thank the panelists themselves. I have, we had a chance to just have a quick conversation before we started. I'm really excited about what, what we're going to be discussing today and what they're bringing to the board. So I'd like to thank Linda Brown, Jennifer Whalen, and Becky Turner for giving their time for the discussion. Thank you. Chantal, over to you. Thanks, Florence, for a warm introduction. And uh, as Florence mentioned, folks, we are going to get right into it with just a little bit of context for you. So as Florence mentioned, today's theme underneath the big broad umbrella of building future ready communities is exploring opportunities in rural communities across Canada. And I am so pleased to have three amazing leaders uh, to join us today to share their unique experiences, stories, lessons learned, and words of advice and inspiration to those of you taking the time to join us today live and for those of you that watch this recording afterwards. So I am going to give you a bit of an introduction to each of our panelists in no particular order other than how I have it written down. Please let me introduce you first to Linda Brown. Linda joined the Students on Ice Foundation, so if you're wondering what SOI stands for, that's what it is, in 2019, where she provides leadership to the alumni team. She comes to Students on Ice with experience in program development and team management as a former manager of youth programs at the Inu Katigi Inuit Center. How'd I do, Linda? Awesome. <laughs> she is strongly connected with the Ottawa Inuit community and has worked with many Inuit youth. As a Royal Canadian Geographic Society Fellow, Linda also delegate, dedicates her time, both professionally and personally, to promoting Inuit culture and advocacy for youth. Now, if you're not familiar already with Students on Ice, let me give you a little bit of context. They launched in 2000, and since then have led more than 35 expeditions to the Arctic, Antarctica, and places in between. Each incredible journey raised the bar on their mission to engage youth, further their knowledge of the polar regions, increase diversity among participants, and encourage cross-cultural collaboration to support a healthy and sustainable future. Welcome, Linda. Also today, we have Jennifer Whalen joining us. Jennifer is currently the Executive Director of the CDDC Emerald. With over 10 years of professional experience, Jennifer has honed her leadership, fundraising, and highly, highly acute administrative skills. She brings her experience and expertise to her role uh, as, the CB, as the Executive Director for the Community Business Development Corporation, 
correct, Jennifer? I got the acronym right? Awesome. Acronyms are so fun. Um, which is a not-for-profit organization that supports entrepreneurs in the creation of small businesses, as well as expansion of existing businesses by providing financial and technical services, which we're going to talk a little bit about today. Jennifer has been recognized for showing dedication, leadership, and excellence in the not-for-profit support services. She's been honored for excellence in, the, in not-for-profit uh, as she contributes to a number of initiatives within the sector and community development through both professional and philanthropic endeavors, including organizations such as CEO and Central Health in Newfoundland and Labrador. Last but definitely not least, we have Becky Tucker joining us from NSCC, or Nova Scotia Community College. Becky is a communications associate at NSCC, where she leads communications for One Nova Scotia and facilitates regional projects and partnerships for the college. Through their network of 14 campuses, NSCC provides Nova Scotians with inclusive and flexible access to education and the specialized industry-driven training for today and tomorrow's workforce. Joining the college in 2019, Becky has facilitated the development and delivery of the MIT Regional Entrepreneurship Accelerator Program, or the REAP, Focus Nova Scotia playing a central support to the five participating teams and a backbone to the organization managing the project. In addition to her experience in communications and working with senior leadership and external stakeholders, Becky has, Becky has a dedicated interest in the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals and the role they have in providing all Nova Scotians with a greater quality of life. When she's not drafting communications and connecting with stakeholders, Becky can likely, likely be found training for an upcoming run or baking amazing. <laughs> Stomach growls on command there. Well, welcome to all of our amazing panelists. Thank you again so much for joining us. And we are going to launch right in with our first conversation starter, which is when you think about the theme of today's conversation, you know, what comes to mind for you when you think about exploring rural opportunities or exploring opportunities in rural communities? in the context of building future ready communities. Just talk to us a little bit around what phrases or words or images or stories come to mind for you. And Becky, I'm gonna start with you to kick us off. Sure, thank you, Chantel. Um, I think what comes to me, comes to mind first for me is really impact and connection. Um, I think COVID-19 has had such a, an aggressive impact across all communities, whether it's rural or urban, and every community has uh, adapted to that in different ways. And I think what I noticed most in Nova Scotia, especially in rural communities, was um, people coming together to support one another. And I think that was really significant. I mean, we saw it in more urban centers like Halifax as well, but the rural communities really stood up for one another when those large impacts were happening. Um, and I think as we look toward the future, that connection to community and people looking for work, I think people are looking for opportunities where they feel like they can make an impact rather than just feeling like they are attached to something they're good at. I actually just saw a statistic today from a group called Brainstorm Strategy Group, and they specifically look at students um, and international students as a subsect of that. And the statistic they shared today was something to the extent of, I think, 50% of students getting ready to graduate expressing that they wanted meaningful work experience above and beyond just salary and compensation. So that was a really interesting characterization actually in, in that particular wording, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah I think, um, I mean, I, I don't know if it's people like really took note at the beginning of the pandemic and, and how it felt personally to be isolated and to try new things for yourself. I know um, I tried my hand at making sourdough. I tend to think I'm a pretty good baker. It did not go over well, um, but like you tried new things and I think maybe as a way of a coping mechanism, but it also was a, a way of people sharing how to do things. There was people posting recipes for sourdough. There was people showing you how to do other, other things. And I think that generates passion. Mm -hmm. And I think in light of everything, so like such a negative, mindset across the board for two years it's it's a really tough thing to go through and I think that's what people want is something that they can feel attached to something that is meaningful that they can feel connected to those around them with 
I thought, and, and Jennifer, I'll open it up to you. What, what, what else would you add to that from, from your perspective? Um, well, the COVID pandemic uh, certainly connected us more than what we've ever been. Um, I mean, Zoom and Teams and whatnot, and uh, we've all had to learn technology very quickly. But because of this remote and work from home, you got people moving into rural communities now knowing that they don't have to live in the city to work now, they can work from home. So that's helping the rural communities uh, bring skill sets to the community. You got people who's able to volunteer on boards now that have more skill sets where it was very hard to find those uh, before. Um, just when I had that, uh, you know, just identifying the gaps that's here in the workforce and uh, seeking ways to train them. So this is where virtual now is going to help the rural communities because employers are looking for uh, training for their employees but can't afford to have them away from the office or away from the job site for very long periods of time plus the cost of travel accommodation. So this is helping the employers in the case of you know overhead costs and, and expenses that uh, now they don't have to uh, entail. But uh, it's great. Um, I'm a believer of lifelong learning. So any training, especially if it's free or low cost, I think anyone, no matter what age, should uh, avail of that. So the virtual part of this, the pandemic, yes. Yeah. So I think as bad as what the pandemic was, it did open a lot of opportunities and more so for rural communities and uh, for small businesses. And, and you know, tech startups could be start anywhere. It doesn't have to be in the city kind of thing. Absolutely. I'm excited to dive into that as we get into our subsequent questions here. But Linda, over to you before we do that. Set the stage for us from your perspective of just what comes to mind when you think of building future ready communities and exploring opportunities in rural Canada. Well, I think of so many things and I think both points that Jennifer and, and Becky talked about definitely impact too, uh, especially when we talk about my, my homeland community uh, are of Nunavut, uh, they're all flying communities. And so the barriers that were in place before COVID, um, accessibility, internet access, all those things have been amplified during COVID. So um, being able to provide opportunities that are brought into the community that, you know, that build on those connections, because yes, I agree. I think that COVID's um, actually, Inuit communities tend to be very connected and, uh, partly because we're mostly related to a lot of them, but uh, having to go remote and the technology has been a, a challenge, I think, for students on ice and how do we make sure that we're engaging those uh, Northern youth who want training and opportunities and they're not missing out because they can't connect through the computer. And then also through our Blue Futures program, um, obviously taking a look at the greener and bluer aspects of uh, opportunities because there's so much potential, um, I think, across the North, particularly um, looking at those uh, solutions that could happen, but ultimately they need to be led by those in the communities. So I think that's, um, yeah, my, my biggest point there. Awesome. And I think, Linda, maybe I'll actually stay with you because you started to kind of give us some hints to, I think, what happened, some learnings and some success stories, perhaps, um, in terms of that you've experienced and or witnessed uh, in, in terms of when you think about how Students on Ice has responded to, um, you know, what the pandemic has brought about, but in the bigger picture of building future-ready communities in exacting the mission, quite frankly, of Students on Ice. What stories can you share with us that the small wins and maybe some big wins of what's worked and, and what have you learned along the way of maybe things that you tried that didn't work so well? I have examples of both for sure. Uh, yeah, I think for the first part, the, the biggest success story that I can think of is a, a program um, that we call Expedition to Community or E to C for short. And it's community-based programming across Inuit Nunagat. Um, and we hire local community coordinators in order to run programming uh, for youth and the youth decide what that programming is. So um, it's, it's an interesting perspective because what's happening in Makovic is very different than what's happening in, in uh, Inuvik. Uh, but there are some shared things that um, being able to talk to someone who's from a different community really helps to say, oh, I should try a shoreline cleanup. I, thought, I think our youth would love to try that or um, things like that. But particularly one story that really stood out for um, building future ready skills. It was about, about six months into COVID 
one of our um, local community coordinators in Kukluktuk um, was working with youth and the youth were complaining that they were missing out on opportunities. They were missing out on things that were coming up, whether it was funding, training, um, even just getting online and watching a webinar because they didn't have access. The school was closed, which was the normal place where they would access the computers. Um, that even if they had access to computers, that they might not necessarily know how to navigate uh, the, the, the internet so that some digital literacy skills would be really beneficial. So this coordinator jumped on that and arranged um, both access to computers and tablets and, and uh, Wi-Fi and uh, brought in a, a person uh, from another community to do some digital literacy to help get those youth ready to be able to tap into uh, amazing training programs. So um, yeah, and again, that's building up. And so then another community heard this and was like, I should mention this to my youth and the youth were like yes we want we want some computers that we can access so we can get into opportunities and not have to leave our communities which is I think the biggest thing for rural and remote communities is often the opportunities aren't locally based and you need to leave and that adds a whole another layer of um, issues and complexities and do they come back once they're trained and those kind of things so yeah I think having programming within community is community led is is one of the big, biggest success stories that we have um, and yeah and I, I would say things that didn't work is you know the expectation that people could spend two and a half hours on zoom uh, with really poor internet so um, finding work around that has definitely been something that we've been looking at doing. I think that's a, a, a challenge that many organizations have, have faced wherever they are, um, whether it's from, from an access perspective and or access and then, you know, ability of people to fully participate in, in the medium, right? Um, there's so many different things that we need to consider when we think about the diversity of how people learn, um, even through a series like this. So I think that's really great to, to see that that's happening even right from the very beginning as programming is being created, but then also, you know, you're tweaking as you go, right, with, with that direct feedback. So I think some key nuggets there. So thank you. And I think some things maybe we'll, we'll dive into in question number three when we come to what do we need to be doing next? What do we need to do further? Um, but before then, uh, Jennifer, I'll, I'll bounce to you. You kind of, again, started to allude to a couple, maybe some potential opportunities that, that living through the pandemic had, had maybe surfaced from an employer perspective. Um, but what else comes to mind for you in terms of success stories or what's, what's worked? What have you seen from your organization or even from your members or the clients that you work with when you think about you know, opportunities in rural communities. What's working? Um, what is working? <laughs> well, um, a lot of our employers um, lack skilled and talented uh, laborers, and uh, it's very hard to find that. And the ability to train them uh, virtually is good, but uh, we have to look outside. You know, for our province, the the our the the job offerings that's there and the number of people that's qualified to even apply for them is, is very, uh, you know, it's not matching up. So um, Newfoundland has a program called Study and Stay. So this is where foreign students come in and they uh, they study and their, uh, their plan is to stay in Newfoundland. So I've had the privilege to be a mentor this past uh, few months with this program and and I've been connected with two ladies, one from Nigeria and one from Bangladesh. And uh, it's, it's amazing that they actually want to live here after they're finished studying. And one is hoping to uh, uh, pursue a, a career in tourism. And, and I'm not coming to Newfoundland and want to pursue something in tourism. Um, but the other lady now wants to start her own business. So um, as an entrepreneur, of course, a, a CBDC. Uh, this is something that we support, and I've been counseling her on that. So when she is ready to start that venture, that you know, so it's about us to attract attracting the the right uh, skill sets and talent and uh, and entrepreneurs. Really, this is uh, you know we're a province that's growing, and uh, there's lots of room in these communities, rural communities especially. 
for these people to join us and if, like I said, if they end up doing something remote or consulting or anything of that sort, that can certainly be done virtual as well. So there's a lot of opportunities for rural and uh, we have to be open to it. And uh, this past year, our provincial CBDC is, is um, educated us on equity and diversity and, and uh, inclusion. So, you know, it's uh, about uh, involving everyone and accepting everyone and uh, getting rid of our unconscious biases that we're not even aware that we have. So, uh, you know, it's, it's times are changing and we have to change in order to uh, have rural sustainability in our communities. So, yeah. I think that's great to hear, Jennifer, in terms of, you know, everybody being educated, right, in terms of particularly when we're, you know, whether it's from the economic development side of things and or organizations like CBDCs that are working with entrepreneurs, it, you know, that has to flow through, right? We, we all have a part to play, and that's a big part of, of what this series, we're trying to encourage everybody to see their role in that. So again, I'm, I'm very excited. Some, some beautiful segues happen here in the conversation. <laughs> Um, Becky, what about from your perspective? What are some of the successes, some of the wins and or lessons learned that you've witnessed um, over the last couple of years with NICC as it relates to today's theme and topic? Um, a, a couple of things that Jennifer and Linda kind of sparked something for me um, that what was said about uh, people staying in community. So getting an education, but then are they willing to come back to that community that they were raised in? Um, and also the number of people that have started coming into more rural communities in the last two years as a result of housing pricing and lots of other factors. Um, so the population has increased in Nova Scotia significantly in the last two years. With that, we have a number, a number of uh, people maybe looking to get upskilling, um, people with uh, skills that weren't in that community before. And so I think like seeing that broad range of skill sets or potential need for upskilling of people. So uh, learning uh, new technology, uh, if an industry has downgraded in a community. So I think in Pictou, Nova Scotia, um, the forestry industry uh, was kind of depleted a little bit. And so you have a whole bunch of people that are from one industry is what they've known for years. And that group of people still has a skill set, but maybe needs to be upskilled in another area to then obtain work. And so when I think of that, um, I also think of the work that I've done with um, our MIT REAP teams. So these teams did a one year program with MIT where the, the outcome was to better understand their functional economic region, which essentially um, the Nova Scotia government did some beta research and identified 11 functional economic zones in Nova Scotia. And each of these are built based on um, identified areas of uh, comparative, comparative advantage. So on our south shore of Nova Scotia, there might be a really thriving industry in mining and in fisheries and in the valley of Nova Scotia, it's less water-based. So we have more agriculture and wine industry there. And so it's kind of based on these industries, but once the teams were in the program, one of their assignments was to do their own regional data collection. So go out to um, entrepreneurs in their region and understand what is, what's getting in your way of like having success in this region. Um, and also um, I can't, if it was risk capital maybe that they went to, to get their understanding as well. And what our teams came back with was not a bunch of data, but they said, we're having trouble accessing and understanding like what gaps there are here because there's not enough data. And so to the point of upskilling, to, to be able to put in the programming in a region, you need to know where the gaps are. And I think that's maybe not necessarily a success story, but in a way it is because we identified the gap is data and we need more data collection to understand what new programs need to be put in place in these regions for there to be economic success across the province. So that's kind of the main one that, that stuck out for me. Um, when these teams completed their program, they each had to identify their must win battle, which is a project that they want to keep working toward in the coming years um, once the program is complete. 
And a couple of teams have these really great, inclusive, like beyond their region uh, ideas. And I think um, something Jennifer, you had mentioned, um, or maybe Linda, <laughs> um, was about um, workforce and labor shortages. And so that's what one of our teams is focused on is identifying those labor shortages, doing more of their own data collection so that they can best address what is needed in that region and then put the programming in place so more people are willing to go to school in that region and stay and work in that region to help the economic ecosystem. I appreciate that, Becky, and then Jennifer, that kind of some, was a little bit of what you and I talked a little bit in our, our pre-panel conversation in terms of how do you line up, um, you know, talent to opportunities and opportunities to talent, and, and it's been an ongoing conversation that I think anybody who's been working in the space of economic development or, or talent development or students or youth, all of the places that are connected to that, it's been a conversation for several years. Um, and so I think it's really interesting that, you know, we're still, we're still talking about it a little bit differently. Uh, and Linda, I'm kind of going to bring it to you for just a minute, because you mentioned the blue and green economy. And to me, I think this is a good maybe opportunity just to actually share a little bit, of, if, if you don't mind, what those actually are for folks who may be not familiar with, with that terminology and, and what maybe the opportunities um, exist within those, those, when we talk around the blue and green economy, could you maybe just give a little bit of context for folks joining us in the series of, about those particular opportunity spots? Absolutely. So uh, lots of people are aware of the green economy and it's um, obviously making um, decisions and, and impacts around climate and ensuring that things are, um, you know, taking into recycling and things like that. The blue economy is somewhat uh, a relatively new term, but it's it's basically anything connected to water, whether it's oceans, freshwater, wastewaters in urban settings. Um, and obviously Canada has a lot of water. Um, and so the, the impacts are really great. And so much so that um, our Students on Ice has always uh, gone on expeditions to the Arctic and Antarctic. And in the Arctic, um, especially our, our C3 expedition and our Arctic expeditions, those go along the coastline of uh, Inuit Nunangat, and uh, which is the one of the longest coastlines. And so most of the Inuit communities are in coastal communities. And so the opportunities for uh, jobs that are uh, related to water are great. Um, there are traditional jobs, things such as fisheries and things like that, but also uh, with innovations, new jobs are coming in and new things, and especially um, the blue and green are often tied together because uh, in order, you know, things like um, if we're doing water testing and things like that uh, and teaching youth how to do that in a community because that's what they're doing um, to you know, learning to do uh, ice readings uh, through the Smart Ice program, which is a partnership. Um, those kind of things are, are really important for us to be able to provide and uh, show those opportunities. It's, uh, yes, green needs blue. Thanks, Tara. Uh, because they work together. You can't separate them. And that's the same with the approach that we take to our programming. Those are the fundamental because um, yeah, some of the old jobs aren't necessarily things that we want continuing in our communities. And even jobs that are like things like mining, um, it's not as straightforward. Yes, we want it. No, we don't. So uh, providing those opportunities for youth and for employers to figure out how that works in northern communities, having the, the lens of either green and blue is a really good thing because it ties very, very nicely with traditional Inuit knowledge about caring for the land or the Nuna and and everything that comes into it. I really appreciate that. I know I put you on the spot there, but it was just a perfect segue. <laughs> and we're talking opportunities, right? And we're in rural communities. And I think clearly that is that is not just for rural communities. It's actually right across Canada. Um, but I think that that's a great thing just to put you know, almost a double emphasis on as we talk around where do we go from here? Right. Um, so yes, and thank you, Tara, for, for jumping in there in the chat. Really helpful. Um, in terms of kind of maybe continuing on that a little bit in terms of starting to move into it. So now what? Right. So we've had some successes. We've had some small wins. We've had some great wins. We've had some bumps along the way in the last two years in particular. Um, 
what advice would each of you give from all of your, your lived wisdom and experience, the, the, the things that you've seen and, and heard of from your um, unique uh, experiences and organizations, how would you characterize the primary role that each of us has to play in this? So you can think about it from um, an employer hat, from an economic development hat, from the college hat or post-secondary, and or quite frankly, also from a the talent that we know we need. We're all part of the puzzle. So I would welcome um, Becky, I'll start with you to speak to that from as many of those perspectives in terms of what would your advice be in terms of what's the role that the global we <laughs> that we all have to play in this building future ready communities, particularly when we look at exploring and creating opportunities in our rural places across the country. The, the best advice I could give would be to break down the silos. Um, a lot of the work I've done, um, what I've seen a lot is one organization working on something and they get ahead of steam about it and they've done lots of wonderful work. And then you meet with another organization who's doing the same thing and, and they're doing a lot of the same work, but these two aren't talking and you're kind of seeing both sides of it. And I think you know, two heads are better than one. If if the work is being done and it's for the collective we, if it's for the, the betterment of all communities, whether it's in one region, on one end of a province or on another, um, I, I think it's, there's opportunity in talking with one another. You can identify challenges that people are facing. You can identify um, things that you haven't thought of yourself. And I, I think there's a lot of value in that so that everybody wins at the end of the day. Um, um, a lot of work that I've done looking into the SDGs is a very similar mindset. The SDGs were set out to be partnered with so that people can work together for those 17 goals. And I think, I think if you take that mindset, it's to work towards something together a great way to say that and I think that's actually you know Jennifer even through your volunteer hat with CEO you know they support women female identifying entrepreneurs who are working towards the UN's goals as well so that you know some connectivity there in terms of frame of mind and, and actioning that mindset right um, so Jennifer I'll, I'll come to you and, and from your perspective advice what role do we all have to play and, and how do we do that successfully um well, from my role as, as uh, CDC Executive Director, I mean, uh, our employers um, are business owners, our employers and, and their lack of uh, finding talent and whatnot, you know, it's, uh, it's being proactive and not reactive, you know, it's identifying the gaps and knowing what needs to be done in the recruitment process and, and whatnot, right? And, uh, but, um, it's even the locals that, you know, even the older generation now are retiring at older age, you know, rather than at the set age, you know, usually. And uh, we could be tapping into that uh, demographic as well, right? Because uh, of the shortage of labor. Uh, and and um, you can't tell someone that they're too old to learn. A lot of people were always told that you're too old to learn, but um, you can learn new skill sets and, and uh, my thought is um, my daughter, she's like 22 years old, and her words to me was, Mom, she's like, see myself having two or three careers in my life. So, you know, to learn skill sets and to be able to transfer across sectors and industries, you know, uh, that's why I encourage learning because uh, what you learn from one industry, you can transfer it to another industry. So don't just limit yourself to just one set of skill sets kind of thing, right? Um I do want to mention um, um, that CDC offers training subsidies for uh, management skills and like, you know, bookkeeping and, and uh, marketing and whatnot for businesses. And when I say CBDC, uh, for those that are, live across Canada, that's referred to as community futures. So if you have a community futures in your, in your community, that uh, they do the same thing. Now, whether they have that training or not, but I'm sure they're able to connect you with some training. But I also want to add that um, rural communities sometimes can't just survive on business, private businesses, but there is a social enterprise option that they can do and co-ops and whatnot. 
and the CDC is a special funding program for social enterprises at a lower interest rates. And so, so I mean, this is the future of rural communities and, uh, you know, everyone is volunteering on organizations and volunteering their time and they're getting burnout, volunteer burnout and whatnot. The social enterprise kind of flips that as in saying, you know, you get compensated, you're putting money back into your community and uh, it enriches the social and economic development in the community. So, and that is, as my role, that's what I like to see in rural communities, right? We wanna see our communities thrive. We wanna see mentally and physically healthy residents that's, you know, giving back into the community and, and just making it a happy place to live. Because a lot of people who live in rural want to stay in rural. And, but when they go away, they don't see any chance of coming back. You know, what am I gonna do when I go back home, right? So uh, yeah, it's, it's about learning the new skill sets, teaching our older generation new skill sets and letting them know that, you know, they don't have to be intimidated by these new, you know, computer, using a computer or uh, taking training on a computer, you know, having that access and stuff. So that's my thought on that one. <laughs> I appreciate that. And, and if you don't mind, Jennifer, I think it's interesting given, you know, the work that the CPDCs do in terms of that entrepreneurial spirit and mindset and then actioning um any any words of advice to somebody who maybe doesn't consider themselves an entrepreneur yet or who has never maybe explored entrepreneurship to date in their career what whether they be somebody who's just graduated from high school or somebody who's got you know a number of years in and look is looking for career number five perhaps any words of advice to, to somebody maybe around how to think about exploring entrepreneurship oh for sure i mean we're here for counseling so business counseling and ideas. And most businesses start off with something that you like. It's an hobby or some kind of skill set that you have that you can monetize it, right? Turn it into a business and, you know, we say turn your passion into profit. So, I mean, it's uh, about finding something that you like and there's a market for, and, and a lot of people think that uh, the market is flooded and I don't, you know, silly for me to start this, right? Uh, but even like online businesses now, like we got a lot of people doing coaching and, and whatnot. And, you know, it's, it, there's always someone out there looking for your services and to think that, oh, someone won't want me or there's too many, the market is flooded. is not necessarily so because when someone buys from you, they're buying from you and your, your um, personality and your customer service and how you give back to them. So that's how you keep clients is, uh, is, is how you treat them really. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you could have like 10 hairdressers, but might be only one that's getting most of the customers because of their skill set, could be because of their personality or, or whatnot. So yeah, there's openings and ideas for anyone. And I encourage anyone, especially youth that's in technology. And I don't matter, don't care how off the wall the idea is, you know, come in and sit down and, and talk with us about your idea. and. Uh, it has you gain more research and, you know, finding out what you're focusing down, narrowing down, basically. Because come on, someone could come in with like 10 ideas, but it's focusing it down on one and uh, going from there. So, yeah. I appreciate that. I think, again, those are explore opportunities that come in all shapes and sizes, right? Uh, so, Linda, from your perspective, uh, what advice would you give um, to folks as they're thinking about what role they have to play? in this idea and the space of building future ready communities and creating and or maybe more so celebrating existing opportunities in rural communities perhaps what comes to mind for you i think the, the first thing that comes to mind is obviously uh, working on building those partnerships and working with communities um it's you know no one knows their community best than the people that live in it and um when you talk about imi Nunangat, particularly, you know, um, the four different regions, there's, um, it's also you need to build in that, uh, the understanding and knowledge around the traditional Inuit culture and how that ties into uh, uh, how things might happen in a community uh, and, you know, keep an open mind that things might not go necessarily the way that you envision them and that you just need to go with the flow with the community and that ultimately, um, I, I mentioned this before, it's channeling those that funding and training and resources straight into those communities, uh, like we do with our e to c program or our Blue Futures Pathways program, in which we, we bring the resources and 
uh, programming to the community and it's not a cookie cutter program they it really works for those communities so again yeah it's building on those connections and the things that are, like you said opportunities that are already there and how can we amplify them break down those silos so the people are all working to collaboratively towards the same goal that and actually very relevant i just uh, saw a question come up around and, and maybe linda will just from your perspective you can speak to maybe the feedback you've heard for students on ice in terms of what was the particular bottleneck or bottlenecks perhaps or barriers in terms of actually being able to access that was it access to internet was it technology or was it a combination of factors you mentioned you know not being able to go into schools was, was part of it but can you maybe expand a little bit around what particularly um, or what particular parts of that barrier of access were noted or came back as feedback? There's def there's so many. Um, and like I said, these were things that were in place before COVID, but COVID just really amplified the, those issues. So access is definitely one of them. Um, you know, a lot of our households um, in Nunavut and actually across all in Nunagat are over, there's lots of people living in a small space because there's such limited housing opportunities. So then, um, you know, if you're trying to do an online course, but you've got 14 other people that are also in the same space, it becomes really difficult to get online and dedicate time for, for education or even just having access to download. I have quite a few friends and family that spend over a thousand dollars a month for internet access and um, and so you can imagine if you are a student or a young person or even someone who's looking older and looking for to upgrade your skills um, if you have to spend that much in order to get online it becomes a, a barrier and even if you can get online there's no guarantee that the connection will be great because weather often still plays a factor um, in internet connections so you might be have all the data that you have in order to get into something but then it's um, a blizzard and you can't connect so those those things were definitely in place beforehand but it, it definitely has gotten worse um, even access to uh, where things are. So uh, my home community in Pang, we have a fisheries thing. So there's opportunities for youth to learn about fisheries. But um, if they want to, you know, learn or train to become a nurse or anything, they have to leave community. Um, and so, you know, that's a big barrier. And like I said, there's so many things and having to leave and culture shock coming down to an urban setting and have to learn all that. So um, yeah, those are some big barriers I feel that uh, a lot of youth have to uh, overcome in order to uh, jump on to, to opportunities and, and training and uh, even like for people who want to open up business in um, small communities um, you might have a great idea that could really benefit the community but there's no physical location in which you can put down your roots because there is nothing because there's such a shortage. So those are the big ones. There's definitely lots of other ones, but those are the two main things that are, are big barriers for um, engagement and opportunities. I appreciate that. Thank you for expanding on that. And, and clearly still work to do um, and lessons to be learned, I think, as all three of you have echoed learning from and, and with. Um, you know, communities themselves, but also uh, across sectors, which is really the whole point of, of this series is to bring conversations like this to light and say, actually, we can learn from um, different sectors. As an employer, I can learn from a post-secondary, I can learn from a not-for-profit and vice versa, um, all because we've, we've got to work towards the same goal, right? Um, and so, you know, we time has flown. So if anybody has any other questions as we come to about 15 minutes before close of the event, please feel free um, to pop them into the Q&A uh, session or right into the chat there, whatever you're most comfortable with. Um, and we'll, we'll make sure we've got some time for them. Uh, in the meanwhile, though, Becky, I'm going to come back to you. And, you know, we've talked a lot around, um, you know, the, the bigger context, right, of which we're all operating in right now and, and coming out of to an extent um, of post uh, COVID-19 and what that has created, what it has re-emphasized and, and brought to light um, in, in big, big ways that were already existing. It's exacerbated certain things. It's created some opportunities. It's a whole mixed bag of things, right? <laughs> um, but given that and 
the evolving nature of, of talent and, and opportunities before the pandemic, um, when you think about advice to the talent, to the people that are maybe looking to, again, explore entrepreneurship or looking to explore working for an entrepreneur, we're not sure what they want to do yet, but to our future workforce and existing workforce now, what advice would you give to them from what you've seen in terms of how can they best equip themselves to be part of future ready communities now? Yeah, I think there's um, a few different ways. Um, the first is going to sound very Brene Brown of me, but I think there is, um, I think there's a lot of value in uh, uh, being brave and being vulnerable. Um, it takes a lot of courage to put yourself out there, to move to a new community, to say, this is what I wanna do. I don't know how to do it. Um, and to just like accept that is, is really vulnerable. And so I think that's kind of step one. Step two is um, every rural community across Canada is going to be different and the, the resources available are going to be different. Uh, so I'll speak to Nova Scotia and what I know, but um, there's a lot of uh, great resources like the enterprise networks or regional enterprise networks in Nova Scotia, which um, are organizations that are connected to small to medium enterprises, entrepreneurs, um, CBDCs. Uh, so I think there's these resources you can connect with to say, here's what I want to do. I'm not really sure the path to go. And they have a great network that they can connect you with to find a mentor or somebody to give you a little bit more information on the avenue you want to take. Um, obviously, I'll be a proponent for community colleges, um, specifically Nova Scotia Community College. Um, we have obviously lots of programs. We have 14 campuses across Nova Scotia. Um, and outside of that, um, when I think of organizations that are looking to attract new talent, um, because that's something that we've been experiencing as well. Um, we have uh, at NSCC, we have community innovation leagues. So one for every region of the province where organizations can reach out to these CILs is what we call them and say, we want to do a customized program to attract this type of talent or to upskill our employees on this type of methodology. And so a custom program is made specifically for the organization and brought in and taught to people. And I think there's value in that. So I'm not sure what the rest of Canada looks like for programming like that, but if it's happening in Nova Scotia, it's likely happening somewhere else as well. Um, so looking for opportunities for uh, customized programming that could provide you with that opportunity to expand uh, whatever avenue you wanna go into. Awesome. I, I think some really great nuggets there and, and absolutely we could have a whole other conversation on upskilling and reskilling and micro credentialing and all of the new pathways and existing pathways of, of, of career journeys. Right. Um, so I appreciate that. And, and Jennifer, from your perspective, um, and I think uh, absolutely from to that to the workforce, to the talent future and existing, no matter where they are in career stage. What advice would you give to them to equip themselves to be able to ride out, you know, the next coming years in a way that sets them up for great economic um, sustainability themselves and for their families and communities? What comes to mind with me is a, a federal funding grant that a lot of employers don't take advantage of, and that's the, the Canada Job uh, Grant. So it's administered through our provincial program, but I mean, all provinces should have that as well. So, I mean, I think if you can get up to $10,000 a year per employee for them to uh, upskill their um, training. So uh, employers can avail of that and that should be on the government website. But uh, yeah, you can get 10,000, you could have several employees that could uh, avail of that. So do you want uh, more skill sets for your employees or you as an employee would like to get more training, you can approach your employer about doing that as well. So. That is a good opportunity for them to uh, learn new skill sets, new talents, and uh, I mean it increases your uh, your you know you're strengthening the business and you're strengthening your career there if you want to continue working there. But again, as an employee, you're learning a skill set that you could take and move on elsewhere as well, right? So it's great there for anyone who wants to uh, 
it enhanced their skills with the careers and this has helped, helped to pay for that. Yeah. Awesome. We will definitely make sure we get the right link to share in our recap. Yes. That's some good nuggets. There's been, there's been several good resources shared through it. So thank you all for that. Um, and last but not least, because definitely, again, this is a start of a conversation from your perspective, Linda, you know, what, what, it, what would be your advice? Or what advice do you give students on, uh, on ICE, youth, and or the alumni that you work with around what do they need to be thinking about or doing to, to prepare themselves to be a part of future ready communities now and for years and years to come? That is a great question. It's actually something in our Blue Futures Pathways, there's actually a portal, it's called the Port, Portal for Opportunities, Resources, and Talent. And um, it's actually for youth, employers, educators, and it's across Canada. So um, my advice would be do research, find people that are in the field, get to know uh, from a, a different perspective of what that job might entail or um, you know, if there's something that really interests you, find out what was the pathway that that person got to that job. So that's what the, the port does is actually helps to let you find those people, find mentors, uh, education materials, um, wage subsidies if you, you're looking to do some training, um, internships, jobs, um, employers can post positions if they're looking for, you know, uh, youth in a particular area, that, you know, it's a, a great way to do it. So it's a phenomenal resource, um, very comprehensive, changes all the time. And yeah, I think it's, you do that research and the more personal that you can find, the better. Awesome. And thank you. I see Tara's popped that in the chat. So thank you, Tara. Again, we'll make sure to grab that um, for, for the written recap. And, and I think because we've got a little bit of time, I, I want to maybe come back to something that has echoed uh, through our conversation today, which is, so if, if individuals leave rural communities, how do we get them back? If they want to come back, how do we how do we create space? How do we create opportunities? How do we tell stories differently? What do we need to be doing differently, or what do we need to keep doing to 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 have a space for people who want to either make their home and or come back home to rural communities in Canada? Any words of advice or wisdom or things that you've seen work really well from either of um, any of your any of your perspectives um, around that point? And I'll, I'll throw that to whoever wants to jump in first. Linda, what about yourself? Anything come to mind? Yeah, I, there's a lot of things. Um, again, I, I myself live in an urban setting and have not gone back to my home community. And, and part of that is because, you know, education, employment, um, uh, housing, those are all big things that, um, played a factor as to why I'm here. And so I think, yeah, if we're thinking about how do we support rural and remote communities and being able to keep or bring back um, uh, talent, it's you, you've got to create the opportunities and, and break down those barriers. So um, one of the programs that a uh, partner of ours, uh, it's uh, Nunavut Savinik Savut, which brings youth from Nunavut um, who aren't quite ready for college, because of education in high schools might not be up to speed, um, but they want to further their education. They, they come to Ottawa, but the supports and things that they're given um, really encourage them to go back into their community. And um, if they don't, if there's, so if they have an interest in a job or a field that maybe doesn't exist because their community is only 600 people, um, NS really helps them, to, or Nunavut Sip and Nixabut really helps them in figuring out how can you go back into your community and have the dream job of your choices and try to work with those partnerships. So um, I think there's some really innovative, thanks Tara for posting in there, innovative ideas of, of how to train people, but ensure that they go back in to where they're from um, and be able to give back to their community that way. So uh, there's some neat examples of advanced and training programs that are in communities and um, they only go out like for a week or two to another community to learn. But the, the sense is to how do we build up within communities to keep them here or bring them back at least. Um, I know that that's an ongoing challenge um, which ties into so many other things, like I said, housing and, and uh, things like that. So. Um, yeah, again, 
every community is different too. So what might work in one community might not work in another. So again, taking that kind of uh, individual approach also would really be helpful. Appreciate that. So that intentionality, and, and as you say, the understanding that every every community and opportunity is unique. Um, I think those are you know relative to a, a number of, of initiatives. When I put my employer hat on, when you think about recruiting talent, and Jennifer, I'm totally going to come to you. <laughs> As we think about, you know, helping employers recruit talent to rural communities, I think, again, there has to be an intentionality there. There has to be an understanding of, you know, what motivators are for that particular person and how to connect to community in maybe really unique ways. Um, anything come to mind for you when you, when, and maybe it's advice you already give uh, your clients and entrepreneurs when they're trying to think around how do they recruit um, and or retain talent, quite frankly, in rural communities. Anything come to mind? I think about a couple of our clients that um, into manufacturing and, and whatnot. And uh, I think of uh, shared labor, like shared uh, sharing the workforce, you know, and uh, being able to, you know, you got some people that's working in the mining industry here that's uh, working seven days on, seven days off. So, you know, during that seven days off, are they available to uh, work at something else, that, you know, employer? And employers need to, um, you know, offer not just wages, but benefits and uh, other social activities and kind of thing. So it kind of helps to retain the employees as well, because anyone working in an environment that makes them happy and feels that they're included they're more likely to stay. So, yeah. Um, but other than, uh, you know, keep recruitment. I mean, if you're only recruiting locally, it's very hard. It's very hard to get someone from outside to move into a smaller rural community. But you might have a husband and wife team that, you know, uh, the wife can work remotely and can move anywhere. So it's even finding those uh, families that, uh, that can move around, even if they came and spent six months here or a year here, you know, just trial runs kind of thing, you know, we're not committing to anything full time, but just, you know, someone wants to take a break from a certain industry they're working in and want to switch out. So some ideas like that. And I believe some or places to have uh, the working the older people working programs too as well. So, you know, it's, uh, you know, we, we don't want to, they don't want to work a 40 hour week or 30 hour week, but they might work a 20 hour week, 15, 20 hour week. So, you know, we can't just exclude them because they, they don't want to work full time. So what about uh, hiring a couple of people on part time and, and just rotating and getting your workforce? You know, a lot of whole of gentlemen sure know how to do the carpentry business or the welding and stuff like that. So, you know, that's um, my advice that way into trying to include it, that what we have, you know, the workforce that we have that that's available to us, the skill sets and talents. I appreciate that. And I think. Becky, I will toss it over to you if you had any you know, 30 seconds or 45 seconds or so from your perspective. Anything else we need to be thinking about in terms of recruitment retention in rural communities? I'll piggyback on what Jennifer said because I've heard it pop up in Nova Scotia as well is shared workforce. Um, rural communities have lots of people that work hourly rates um, in various industries and and if they can be shared amongst a few different employers, it benefits the whole region. Um, the only other one I would add in is uh, maybe relying or looking to hire people on a remote basis if the industry uh, is applicable, because there's lots of talent out there. So don't just look within your own region, especially if you can help hire somebody on from somewhere else. Awesome, and, and thank you so much, panelists. Time flew. It does in these conversations. I think, again, you've been a wealth of knowledge and, and information and resources. So thank you also, uh, Tara, for popping things into the chat and our panelists as well for doing that along the way. We will make sure we grab all of those nuggets. Um, into the folks that were joining us today, there is a brief survey. We would totally appreciate if you could take 30 seconds, give us some feedback. Um, this series is going to continue. Our next event is on April 21st, looking at building a future of work for all, and that's going to be hosted in French. And then we have another ser another ses session on April 28th, which is exploring what are soft skills in 2022. So if either of those things of interest to you, please join us. And for now, join me in saying a welcome uh, or thank you rather uh, to our amazing panelists.
thank you. Thank you so much for your time today. Much appreciated and wish everybody a beautiful rest of your day wherever you are in Canada. Thank you, everybody.